March 17, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Amanda Keelan, K-E-Y-L-O-N. Ellen Keelan, the name I go by. Yeah, Ellen Keelan. Okay. Mrs. Keelan, where were you born? Lipton County, Indiana. March 17, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Amanda Keelan, K-E-Y-L-O-N. Ellen Keelan, the name I go by. <laughs> yeah, Ellen Keelan. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Keelan, where were you born? Tipton County, Indiana. And when's your birthday? July the 5th. Born 1896. 1896. Who was your father? Jesse Pewterball. He had no middle name. Was he from Indiana? Yes. Well, originally, I think from, Ten from Pennsylvania, his, his folks at least. And who was your mother? Uh, Nancy Jane Geringer. How do you spell that? G-A-R-R-I-N-G-E-R. Was she from Pennsylvania? No, she was from Ohio, I believe. Ohio. What kind of work did your father do? He was a farmer. Farmer. How long did you live in uh, Indiana? I lived there until I was 12 years old. Now, he came there in 1880, I believe. to Tipton County. Now he had come from Jay County, that's the eastern part. Yeah. Uh, what's the nearest town? Tipton, Elwood. Okay, Tipton, is that the name of the town? Yes, Okay. The name of the county too. That's the county okay. seat, Tipton was. What part of Indiana is that? Uh, it's about uh, 50 miles north of Indianapolis, I believe. Okay, you know where Fowler, Indiana is? Fowler, Indiana? Fowler, no. Maybe it's a hundred miles. Okay. Fowler no. is up the, that's where my grandmother's from. She's from Fowler, Indiana. Fowler? Small place in, well, I've been yes, away from there small. since I was yeah. 12 years yeah. old. <laughs> well, she left when she was two, I think. Oh. Uh, now, Madison County was close, and Anderson, Indiana. Yeah. It's the county seat of Madison. Mm-hmm. Um, how come your father came to Indiana from Pennsylvania? I wouldn't know. That's farther back than I know. Yeah. I was I was among the younger of the children. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and at the age of twelve, you you left Indiana. Yes. And moved to Texas. Texas. Hanford County, Texas. Sherman County, Texas. Sherman like. County, Texas. Yes. My father and my family moved. It'd be about eighteen ninety eight. No. 1980. 1980. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> 10 years off. <laughs> Math is not my subject. How come you moved to Texas? Uh, my father had a mortgage coming due in Indiana, and uh, we he made uh, plans, arrangements to bring the end to our family. I had Two brothers and two sisters were married at that time, and the whole caboodle came here uh, to Texas. Mm -hmm. Our post office was Texoma at that time, even, and uh, he could get a lot more land, and he got a smaller mortgage, and uh, he had big ideas, but he lost the farm completely. Small mortgage that couldn't raise crops here like it did in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Texoma, they paid too high price for the land too. Yeah. Is the Texoma in Sherman County? No, it's on the it's on the state line. Or Texas the county. State. No, where Sherman County, Texas. Okay. Yeah. I work over there, it's in Sherman County. Okay. Yeah, okay. just across the Texoma, state line. Texoma, Texas is Sherman County. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> what part of the uh, county did you settle in? Well, we were 25 miles southeast of Texoma. Okay. I just wouldn't know. It was close. It answered in Sherman. Part of our land was in Hanford, part of it was in Sherman County. Okay. 
I think they paid about $17 an acre for it at that time. And later my husband and I had figured out together we should have got it for about seven and a half or yeah. $10. Did you come by train? Yes. What was the train trip like? Oh, it was quite interesting for me, <laughs> 12 years old. <laughs> How um, long did it take? I think it took about two days. We had to change trains. We got on a train at uh, Tipton, perhaps. Changed trains at St. Louis and again at Kansas City. What's Came your, out on down to Texoma. What's your best memory of the train trip? Oh, I believe it was sleeping in a Pullman car. It's the only time I ever did. <laughs> what is the, What is it like to sleep in a Pullman? I've never <laughs> been inside of a Pullman. <laughs> I think I slept in the upper part, and uh, my sister had two small children, and my sister-in-law had one. I suspect I helped to take care of the children. I think the, uh, the Negro, what do they call them, the fellows that work on the train. The conductors? No, uh, it wasn't the conductor. Porters? Porters, probably. Porter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They made up the beds, of course, at a certain time. I suppose they waked us up in the morning to get up. Mm -hmm. uh, did um, your parents pack up everything and bring everything out here with them? No. No, we had a sale in Indiana and uh, sold all of our horses but one. And uh, we brought a, a buggy horse out here and a, a buggy. Okay, so you didn't hire an immigrant, an immigrant car then? Well, we had uh, we had lots of furniture and stuff to bring. Came two different times. It was a uh, on uh, one came in November, and another group came in December. Okay, so your family was split up during that period. Yes. Okay, which group did you come in? With? I came with the first one. The first group. Did you start the school in Indiana? I did. I started when I was five years old. What was the name of the school? I don't remember. <laughs> That's been a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. What was your favorite subject? I think reading, perhaps. My biggest disappointment, well, though, was I was just ready to start the eighth grade that year when I was past 12 years old. Came to Texoma, didn't get started at school till. Uh, in uh, February, perhaps, mm -hmm. January anyway, put me back in the fifth grade. I hadn't had Texas history, and I don't know why they didn't give it to me extra. They just put me back. From, I never did make it to the eighth grade again. What school did you start in Texas? It was on the Texas side here. It was a, uh, a small building. It must have been a frame. Remember your teacher's name? Mabel Laughlin was one. I guess the one that I had. Mm -hmm. I think there were two teachers and they mm -hmm. had just one room, I think, one room school. Yeah. As a child, what kind of chores did you do around the house? I can't even remember when I learned to milk a cow. <laughs> so I don't know. But I do remember uh, helping the milk. We had a big barn and several cows. Mm -hmm. And I'd, uh, I remember going to the barn with a lantern light to help with the milking. And I suspect I did some work in the garden. I okay. didn't have any babysitting to do because I just had one brother younger than I that lived. Mm -hmm. What about laundry? Pardon? What about laundry? Did you have to do laundry? No, I don't think so. Mm. I probably helped with the chickens, gathered the eggs. How much uh, land did your father buy in Texas? 1,600 acres. 1,600 acres. And he had 240 in Indiana. Mm -hmm. It was worth $125 an acre at that time. Yes, he thought the land he was getting here was real cheap, but he paid too much for it. Right. 
Now, were you farmers or ranchers out here? Farmers. Farmers. What What'd you raise here? Maize, mostly. Eventually, we raised some wheat. And uh, I wasn't at home for about three years. I worked out in different homes, housework, hmm. dollar and a half a week. Who'd you work for? Uh, one lady by the name of Mrs. George Spivey. Well, you just, what, clean? Uh... Yeah, just just worked like one of the children would in the family. I was 14, 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And Mrs. Webb Horton was another lady I worked for. Now, they operated a ranch. Cattle ranch. Well, the Spiders had a sheep ranch. Hmm. Sheep ranch, that's unusual. Uh-huh. Yes, there were several sheep ranches around in that area. When you came by train, did you come to Texoma by train? Yes. What was your first impression of Texoma? Mm-hmm. Well, the thing I remember was a roller skating rink. <laughs> a roller skating rink? <laughs> yes. I couldn't skate. <laughs> I don't know what I ever did uh, at that time. I did later some a little bit. Hmm. And then, uh, well, we lived in town uh, when the second group came. Then I moved into town with them and some of the other folks was out on the farm. But my mother was, my stepmother was expecting a baby. She was born in February and we moved out to the farm in March, I'm pretty sure. You say your stepbrother? Yes, my stepbrother. How big was Texoma? Mm, I don't know. It wasn't very big, but I know the streets were just dirt streets, of course, and board walks, if there's any walks at all. We, uh, we spent our first days at the Weatherly Boarding House. Where was that located? Oh, uh, it was on West Main Street, I believe. Who ran that? Uh, Mrs. Weatherly. She has a daughter that living here now. She was expecting that baby when we moved to Texoma. Hmm. Her name is uh, Palmer. What's her first name? Pauline. Pauline. Pauline Palmer is her name. How long did you stay in the boarding house? Pardon? How long did you stay in the boarding house? Oh, we probably weren't there over, or I wasn't there over three or four days. I went to the farm with my father and the brother-in-law who was a carpenter. We were going to build the shacks that we were going to live in. And we did live in shacks, I mean. <laughs> what was the inside of the boarding house like? Was it like a hotel or? Well, we just sat down like a family. It was family-style meals. And then you moved out to the ranch and you lived in a shack? Yeah, it was a shack. <laughs> uh, frame, frame building covered with a heavy canvas. And two rooms. There were five of these buildings eventually on the place. And uh, there was one for each of my two brothers that were married, my two sisters that were married, and then one that was going to be for a father. And your father had 1,600 acres? 1,600 acres, yes. Mm-hmm. Did, he work, did he plow this land by horse? Yes, we never had any tractors. He didn't plow at all. I, was I don't know plow. how much farmland he ever did have. Probably 200 acres would have been as much as he had plowed. Mm-hmm. Part of it wasn't even fenced. The uh, cattle ranchers got the advantage of that. We didn't get anything out of it. Did your father have any cattle? Just the uh, milk cattle was all. Milk cattle. He uh, he bought two milk cows, just picked them out of a herd of ranch cattle for fifty dollars each, and one of them was a real good milk cow, milked easy. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, what kind of house did your father build? Eventually, he built a house out of rock, rock cement. I think the floor was cement. Is it still standing? No. No, I've been to the place several times, and uh, well, it's been several years since I was there last, and there wasn't anything there where we picked up a piece of slab of cement that we put in our own walk out here. Mm -hmm. How long did your father have the farm? Uh, he died in 1914. That was uh, six years after we mm -hmm. moved here. Okay. After your father died, what did you do? I was married just a few weeks before my father died. And uh, this Hardy Keelan. Yeah. And we moved to Lockney, Texas. Where did you meet your husband? Working for J.H. Groover on a ranch. They had a sheep ranch also. And that has been 69 years ago this June when we married. Married in 1914? 1914, right. 1914. Mm -hmm. And then in 1917, we moved back up to this area. My father had lived in Texas. My husband had uh, filed on a claim in Oklahoma, about 13 miles northwest of, mm -hmm. of Texoma. Yeah. Where's your husband from? He was from Tennessee. He lived there until he was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Was he in the military? No. He was just he just ready to be drafted when the war ended, I think. I don't know whether he would have been or not because we had several children and he was a farmer. Yeah. That's the World War II. No, World War I, I'll War. take that back. I was wondering if he was old enough for the Spanish-American War. No, no, I don't think so. Was he Born in 83... In 1900, you'd only been 17. What, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He'd have just missed you then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. After you got married, you moved to where? We lived at Lockney, Texas. Our first child was born there. That's Floyd County. Mm -hmm. How come you moved there? Well, he was working for this Mr. Gruber at that time on the general store at Lockney. And he got a job there. Is this the Gruber of Gruber, Texas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you know him? Did I know him? Yes, yeah. I worked for them. That was where I was working when uh, I met my husband. What was he like, Mr. Gruber? He was a real likable man. He was very quiet. And he uh, they had a sheep ranch, I remember. Uh, he just seemed to love the sheep. He called them lammies, the pet name he had for them. And everybody liked him. He was, a, he was an honest man and, a, and a well fixed. He would, wouldn't have been called wealthy at that time, I don't think, but eventually they did get pretty well fixed at River, Texas. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay in Lockney? We stayed until February 1917. We went in June 14. And uh, all this time your husband worked for Mr. Gruber? Yes. What General you, store. The general store. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Gruber's son had a, a, a sold a Harley Davidson motorcycles. And my husband really liked motorcycles. He was strong on uh, motors of any kind. He didn't care much for horses. Yeah. And uh, he and Mr. Gruber, uh, when Mr. Gruber traded for the store at uh, Lockney, he took over a lot of debts. And he and Mr. Gruber rode all over the country uh, collecting those debts. On a motorcycle? Yeah, a sidecar to it. <laughs> and that was the same outfit we used to take our honeymoon on. He came up here. I was living in this area at that time down below Texoma with my sister and he came after me there. Our trip back to 
locked me with our honeymoon with a sidecar. Eventually, I learned to drive the motorcycle with the sidecar. I never tried it without. <laughs> Have you ridden one recently? Pardon? Have you ridden one recently? Oh, no. <laughs> I think my husband did just a few years ago. <laughs> Was with there... somebody else driving it. Yeah. Was there much work for the war effort in this area during World War One. Much work for what? The war effort during World War One. Oh, not that I remember. You see, whenever we moved from Lockney, we moved out on the farm. And uh, 13 miles from town was a long ways from town. Yeah. <laughs> that time it was all wagon travel. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know much about what whatever was taking place was in town, probably, mainly. But you didn't do any, like, knitting for the soldiers? No. Or... I just don't remember doing anything, only raising food. Yeah. You remember Armistice Day? November 1918. Uh, yeah, 19... 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. I just don't remember. Probably several days before we heard anything yeah. about it. We didn't have a telephone, of course, no radio or anything like mm -hmm. that. And uh, you had moved back here? Yes, to Texoma? on the claim. Okay. Did, okay, you say you were on a claim, you heard them file a claim? Yes, okay. in 19, he came in 1905, I think it's early 1906 when he filed. And then in 1914 is when we were married. Now, was this in Oklahoma or Texas? We married in Texas, but his claim is in Oklahoma. Okay. And how long did you live on the claim? Uh, we were there until 1947. Mm -hmm. Within 30 years. And was he a farmer on the claim? Yes. What did he raise? Well, he raised mainly uh, wheat and Capricorn, or, yeah, Capricorn and Mala maize. We never had many, much stock. We had the Holstein milk cattle, yeah. milk cows. We had a family of eight children, four boys and four girls. What was life on the claim like in the 1920s? Pretty simple. <laughs> we had a little... One room house. The top of it was a had been a dugout top. And the bottom was cement. The husband had bought a concrete mixer. Mm -hmm. We could get all the sand we wanted for free. Cement and water and work was all it took hardly to build. And many people when they inside of our house they thought we lived in the dugout, but on the outside it was here up on the top of the ground. And we, uh, we lived in that little place that's more than a little bit bigger than this here, maybe. Uh, so we had five children. Then you had to <laughs> go to a bigger place? <laughs> yeah, we, we added to it. You added we to added it. to it two or three times. Okay. Is that house still standing? Yes. We sold that place to our son in 1952. He died in 1976. And his widow and her son and the family still live on this same farm. They live, they have two houses. There's three houses there now with the old one. Mm -hmm. How did the depression affect you and your family? Well, sometimes we wondered <laughs> where the next meal was coming from. We did have hogs and chickens and cows. We had our meat. And I remember uh, for the lack of food, cattle, cow feed, the government bought some of our cows. It seemed to me like they paid us a dollar a piece for them. 
They shot him and killed him right there, and we could butcher him, get what meat out of it. We could, of course, it's in hot weather. We couldn't get very much because we couldn't save much of it. We didn't have any way of saving it. And, uh, what was your basic meals during, during those years? What did they consist of? Uh, bread and gravy and <laughs> meat, <laughs> eggs. Well, we had garden, mm -hmm. and we had a good windmill and well. And uh, we we raised quite a bit of garden stuff, food from our garden. But in those days, there wasn't any way much to put it up. We did canned pickles, beets, and cucumber pickles, <coughs> tomatoes. And that was just about all. And kraut, we made kraut and candy. And I think there were times when we couldn't pay the taxes at all. The government just carried us for taxes. And we weren't in debt. That was good. <laughs> yeah. But your deals consisted mainly of meat, bread, and gravy. Yeah, well, we, when we bought potatoes, it really tasted good. Well, we had beans. I guess we had beans most of the time. What did you have for breakfast? Uh, eggs and bread and butter and eggs, probably, mainly. Well, we had... We cured our own meat. We had... Uh, but... Uh, it wasn't the kind of meat we have today. <laughs> Our bacon and ham would get so strong in hot weather. Mm -hmm. And there were times uh, when it first began to rain just a little bit. I remember one time in particular when it rained and the dust was blown at the same time and it plastered mud on our windows till it got so dark in the house that we had to light the lamps. And it was cool our lamps, of course. I was going to ask, what were the dust storms like? I've got some pictures of You want to shut that off till I get you some pictures? Sure. I've got dust storms that we would uh, <clears throat> do our washing in the afternoon, hang the clothes out at night after the wind had calmed down. They'd dry, take them in the next morning. Those That's pictures bad. have all got our name on them, I guess. Yeah, I have um, I have a form here. A claim, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that. This is a grain elevator. That's here. a building there. No, this. that. Well, that isn't it then. Somebody else took that picture, and you want to take those? I'd like to take this one with the car in it too, if I could. With what, the car? Yeah, this one, if I could. Mm -hmm. Well, that's taking it liberal, of course. Yeah. It seemed like the wind just blew straight, but the dust just rolled. Huh. Seemed like it just came rolling. Uh, it wasn't like a, a, oh, what do you call it? <laughs> Whirlwind. Yeah. Tornado. No, no, yeah. it wasn't like a whirlwind even. How long would a dust storm last? It didn't last through the night, I don't believe. No, I don't believe so. Then, though, after it got real, it just kept getting drier and drier, of course. It started getting dry, I think, about 1930, 29, maybe. And it... Uh, after a while, it just got so the dust just blew with just a little breeze because everything was dust, practically, just piled up in piles. It wasn't very sandy around where we lived. Now, places where it was sandy, it was even worse, I guess. I mean, it piled up worse because the sand was drier than the soil was. Hmm. Uh, the dust storms lasted for how many years? I think it was beginning to get better about in 1938. 38. Uh, our school, out, we had, our children went to the country, country school to start with. Our school was transferred to Texoma, consolidated, and my mm -hmm. husband got a job driving a bus. And that got, got us on our feet again. Good. Of course, whenever World War II came along, my 
prices got higher for all of our farm stuff and mm-hmm. everything. That. What were you doing when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? I don't think we knew about that for a day or two. <laughs> we were planning to have a Christmas gathering at home. We had a daughter in Indiana going to nursing school. And we had a son was living in California. He was working for an airplane factory, I believe. He first worked at Wichita, Kansas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you do any work for the war effort during World War II? Nothing, only gave some kids. Yeah. We never lost any. That's but that one time we had a, a daughter in nurses training under the auspices of the government at Wichita Falls, Texas. And our oldest daughter was a registered nurse. She went in as second lieutenant. She volunteered. And our oldest son was in the Coast Guard. Our second son joined the Army and later transferred to the Air Force. He was in the Air Force, or in the service, 23 years, most of the time in the Air Force. After he got out, he... Went to college and became a teacher, and he's a school teacher in Hawaii now. Where does your oldest daughter live? She lives in Cincinnati, Ohio at this time. She uh, spent some time in Alaska. A few years she married in Alaska. You say she was a second lieutenant? Yes. And was a nurse? Yes. Where did she serve? Uh, she was right at the evacuation hospital when the surrender was made just right next to the front. She went to England. Well, she served in Europe, of course. She went to England, and uh, she was in France, in Germany. And just before the surrender, she had signed up to go to Japan. And, uh, What's her name? Paola Keelan. <laughs> her name is Elkins now. Paola Keelan Elkins. She but, lives in Cincinnati? Yeah, she lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. But I don't remember now whether uh, whether she was on the way. She may have been on the way to Japan when the surrender was made. But anyway, they brought her to the United States, and that was it. She didn't go mm-hmm. to Japan. And then they, for you, for they were tired of <laughs> oh, That was the surrender in Japan. Right. That was the end of the war. Um, I'd like to regress and ask about the flu epidemic of 1918. 1918, yes. My husband had it first. He had it real bad. But we had no doctor. Everybody was sick, practically. Mm -hmm. And then our oldest daughter, the oldest child, was about two, two and a half years old. She had it. And I had it. But my husband's brother, who was single, didn't have it. He was able to get around and take care of the chores and the animals and uh, sort of see after the rest of us and see that we had food. What kind of uh, medicines or remedies did you use for the flu? We just went to bed, I think. It was about all we could do. We had, uh, I guess, neighbors and friends that we knew that died with the flu. I don't remember whether it was real bad in this area or not. Of course, it wasn't settled up very much. There wasn't very many people here, comparatively. What started that epidemic? I just wouldn't know. I'd heard that it was soldiers coming back from Europe. I bet you know, that's what it was. Brought it over. May have been. Yeah. Well, in 1918. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, well, that's about the time World War One started, wasn't it? So that's no, when it when ended. It was, over. was it? Yeah. Uh, that, it may have been the European uh, flu. Yeah. I don't remember ever hearing called that though. Let me see. What did you think of the atomic bomb? I'm afraid of it. 
<laughs> I don't I don't have any use for a bomb cellar. Mm-hmm. I visited one of my husband and nephews at Albuquerque one time, and he had a bomb cellar, and he showed it to us. And the first thing, when you go in at the door, there was a gun, and it was loaded, I think. And, of course, he explained that that was in case somebody tried to come in and crowd them out of their bomb cellar. It would just be the end of it. Do you think we should, we should have dropped the bomb on Japan, the atomic bomb? Um, I, I could hardly say. Mm-hmm. If it was to do over, I believe I'd say no. But at that time, and the way things were going, perhaps there's more lives saved eventually by the bomb being dropped. But then it has grown into such a big thing since then. It's, it's out of control, I think. True. Well... Uh, do you have any stories that your parents or your grandparents told you? No, my grandparents all were dead but one grandmother when we left, well she died before we left Indiana even. I was, yeah, I was 10 when my last grandmother died. And I don't remember, she was 89 years old, and that was quite old at that time. Mm-hmm. I don't remember her telling anything about their experiences or anything. And I never heard anything about the move that my father made from the eastern part of Indiana to the central part. She was just too busy. Yeah. <laughs> had a good sized family. Eventually, he had 14 children. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about your life in the panhandle? Has it been, would you do it over? Oh, yes. Yeah. I have no desire to live anywhere else. And uh, we weren't a bit uh, afraid during the dust storms, even in the the Depression at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we never thought much about leaving here at all. Most of my folks lived in Indiana, and they thought surely we'd come right back to Indiana because we'd, uh, the dust would kill us if we stayed out here. But I have made the remark that I thought uh, a few years afterwards when people got to using uh, tractors, the open tractors, and I've seen my folks come in from the field on a hot, sweaty day sweat all over their face and their face covered with dust worse than it ever was during the dust storm. Mm-hmm. Well, during the dust storm days we got in the house. There wasn't anything to do outside anyway on to take care of the stock. Chickens. And How pigs. did you keep the dust out of your house? You just shut the door. Shut the door? <laughs> I've heard of people who did hang wet sheets up at the door. But I think our house was a fairly tight build. And it was small, mm-hmm. didn't have many openings in it. My husband was a, a carpenter by experience. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they built their own buildings for the most part. They were made out of cement. Yeah. Well, I think we had a pretty good interview. <laughs> I hope it's been worthwhile anyway. How many kids do you have? Eight, four boys and four girls. How many grandkids? We have 23 living, two dead. How many great grandkids? 22. Any great great Two more expected, no. <laughs> Not yet, our oldest great grandchild is only be 17 in June. Okay, thank you. At the table. Upside down. <laughs> yeah, so the dust wouldn't get in them. <laughs> The dust got in the house, all right. Well, how'd you breathe through all that dust? Well, it just wasn't that bad, don't seem like. And we could always put a wet cloth over our face and keep the I, dust out. I've heard of dust pneumonia. I guess there were a few people here had it. And I'm not sure, but what it was, somebody perhaps that was exposed to the weather was outside. 
We stayed inside. There wasn't, wasn't any farming to do, and as I said, nothing much for us to do, only take care of our animals, yeah. our chickens and 